Welcome, Lee. Thanks, Mike. Good to join you. There's a great Australian book titled A Fortunate Life. I reckon it could be the story of your life, actually. Uh, yeah, well, I've sort of worked, worked at my hobby the whole life, really, and I guess I've got a reasonable amount of fame and fortune out of my, sort of my, uh, my footy life. So I reckon if you can work at your hobby, make it your livelihood as well, you're lucky. That's me. Eight premierships, four as a player, four as a coach. Yep. You're now a highly respected commentator, contented husband and... And grandfather. I mean, yeah. it looks like everything's in place for you. Well, it is, but I'd like to be 20 again. Because, Would you really? Yeah, because, I mean, I think the, um, for me, the, uh, the memories I've got from some really, you know, some nice sporting achievements and all those kind of things, you know, the, the, it's when, the, when it's just happened is when it's the best. And in a way, you'd, you know, I often think you'd like, you'd like to be going into it again rather than to a large degree having you know that that part of your life come and gone so what so you take the risk of replicating all that you've done to have another crack at it yeah i would hmm, interesting what what do you like are you a good grandfather uh, i try to be yeah yeah I mean, I mean i think i i think like most of us who get to the grandfather stage you know you know when you were a father I mean, I, and i look back i mean i was so focused on what i wanted to do with my footy for instance you always felt like you know so much of your time was was on your career and, and therefore, you, the prioritising of your, of your kids, um, you always will get really concerned whether you, you, know, you prioritise them enough. So I suspect that's a fairly normal grandparent feeling. So when you become a grandparent and you've got uh, the next generation, you say, oh, I don't want to waste my, my offspring's offspring, you know, being, being young again. Now, I suspect all premierships, have, they've all got their own appeal. Mm. Does one of your eight stand out for any particular reason? It's funny, the, the, the premiership as a player are kind of a combination of your role within the game and the team performance, like they're all being melded around at the same time. And for me, the, the, the sort of the footy joys came more out of uh, playing than coaching. But on grand final day, if you win the premiership, coaching's even better uh, because the team's the only thing you've really got as a coach. So I kind of think the memory of the siren time or when you think you've won the game on the four that I've coached are kind of almost more sharp and more memorable than, than the playing ones. Certainly an extra dimension at Collingwood, wasn't there? I mean, it had been yeah. so long, 32 yeah. years between premierships there, and it was as if you'd sort of delivered them to the promised land. Yeah, but that's, that, that's kind of a supporter's view. I mean, at the time, you, um, you, you're just wanting to have that fantastic feeling of joy that happens when you, if you can win a grand final and get through that year's campaign. So the post grand final in 1990 when the all the masses tens of thousands of Collingwood supporters sort of join in the joy and celebration you can you know you appreciate that and you're glad for them but that's not part of kind of what you're doing I don't think uh, and until the game is won smile on his face yeah but you did there was a huge release of emotion yeah. from you that day I mean you hugged Gubby Allen oh, arms yeah. pumping in the air oh well that, that was just I guess winning the premiership and being uh, as a coach I mean, again, I, I might have been involved in eight premierships, but that's over 37 years. So it's like eight days in 37 years if you want to do <laughs> that's those, ma- uh, those mathematics. And it's true that. So, yeah, that, that, that venting of emotions late in the 1990 grand final. Because the, the moment when, or, when you know you're going to win, sometimes it's the final siren or sometimes a minute or two or whatever. It's just that, such a special moment and the adrenaline flow is just massive. The Herald Sun football writers uh, voted you the player of the 20th century. It's now become conventional wisdom. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what does that tag mean to you? Well, I like that tag. I mean, if, 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 if what was my ambition as a young man, young player, was to be the best player ever. Was it really? Yeah. At what I've point? always been lucky. I always had like high ambitions and a short memory. So you can never achieve you can never achieve that ambition, but you can never feel you've made it either because you never achieve that but the fact that that the group of footy writers made that view and as you say that's become a little I get introduced <laughs> as the player of the century as if it's something official I mean it's a it's a lovely tag to have now you talked about uh, wanting to be the best player ever what, what age of your life are you talking about 
Oh, from the time back I can remember, um, we uh, I, was, I was sort of grew up, grew up in a footy family, and so footy was I mean cricket in the summer maybe, but footy was always the big sport. So I, there was never a time where I didn't want to play. I can't remember a time where I I didn't want to go and play it when I got old enough. My memory is that you were a North Melbourne supporter. Was yeah, and your hero was uh, Alan Ayler. That's is that right, correct? number seventeen. Yeah, correct. Yeah, is that because he was sort of a rover and? And what was what was the appeal of Nick um, to you? Oh, probably he was the the main, the, just the main North Melbourne player of that early late fifties, early sixties, if I can recall. Um, I mean, I was a very small kid. I guess I'm a small adult, but certainly up until I was fifteen, I was very small. And uh, um, I don't think it was the Rover thing more that he was just probably captain, main player. Eight best and fairest at Hawthorne in a golden era. I mean, did you ever feel sorry for Knightsey and Michael Tuck and Kelvin Moore and blokes of that ill? <laughs> nah. <laughs> um, that, yeah, no, I mean, well, you know, the, you, I remember one year, for instance, I think one year Knightsey and I tied for the Hawthorne best and fairest, but at that point of time, there was a countback system or something, and I think I won it on the countback. I think they've since, since sort of gone back and said, well, both myself and Peter Knights won it in that year, but... Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it was, it's nice at the end of the year, I guess, to, uh, to get that recognition from within your, your match committees, which is the, the people who were judging you the most harshly, I think. Gee, you must have had a fair year in 1971. Peter Hudson kicked yeah. 150 goals and you won the best and fairest. Well, well, yeah, I mean, it was a, I guess it was a breakout year. I mean, that was the first year that I guess became a regular senior player. It was my third year and uh, um, got, got a berth in the Victorian team that year. But um, I was still only 19 and I, I know I won it that year, but it wasn't. I don't look at 71. I mean, I think the peak of my career was more like the later 70s, I think. But uh, um, we had a fantastic year as a team, of course. I think we won almost 19 of the 22 games. We only just fell in in the grand final, but it's, it's, it's so far ago for me, it's just hard to visualise what it was like uh, in that first uh, year or two. Tell me about, uh, it's an individual award I know, but the Brownlow, yeah. 73 and 82, I think you were placed in both those Brownlow yes, medals. Yeah. Should you have won a Brownlow medal and did you want to win one? Oh no, there's no such thing as should. Yeah, I'd love to have won the Brownlow medal because that's the league's official award. I'd love, I'd love to have won one, but uh, I mean, clearly to win it, you've got to get the most votes in any one year. Mm-hmm. And I never did that. So uh, I, uh, I sort of went to the Brownlow two or three times, you know, thinking, oh, maybe I'm a good chance tonight. Um, but as we know, there's no form guide to the Brownlow, really, and, uh, and it just never worked out. Which year was the one when you thought, I really have a good chance? Oh, 77, I think, was, I think 77 was the best year I played, I'm pretty sure. And so that was the year I, I, I thought I had the uh, probably the best chance. Because I think, I mean, we you only know yourself on the Moody Awards, and I think I won the majority of the Moody Awards that year, um, but didn't, uh, you know, it was third or fourth in the Brownlow, but certainly a long way from winning. 300 plus games, this, this is going to test your memory. Is there one that, that stands out for you in the terms of pure excellence? Oh, well, probably the probably the game, the best game I probably played, and I ha- I can't say I can remember it, but it was Easter Monday of '72, '73 when I, I kicked the 11 goals and had a fa- lot of the footy against Essendon at Waverley. I think that was probably the best individual game I I would have played. I think that was '73. You did kick 11 goals and you had 38 disposals. Yeah, yeah, I was at that you know the kind of yeah a lot of the footy you kicked a lot of goals. So I, that I've got to say that was probably the. Tell me, uh, tell me what happened when you were, Hawthorne was leaving the ground. That, uh, <laughs> yeah, that was, well, that was uh, that was a situation. My younger brother Calvin was playing with uh, with Hawthorne that uh, that day as well, and as we were leaving the ground, <laughs> somehow or other, when he jumped down into the dugout to go up the race, he cracked his head on the uh, on the concrete top. He knocked himself dugout. out. Didn't he? Well, knocked himself out. Did himself some damage anyway. Uh, yes, yeah, so that was a strange finish to the day. Did you have a crack at him for trying to upstage you on your <laughs> yeah. big day? Yeah, yeah. No, un- un- yeah. unusual event at the end. Now, Lou Richards christened you Lethal Lee. Yep. I'm not sure how it sat with you, but your mother Lorna wasn't particularly <laughs> taken by it, was she? You no, know, I don't think she particularly. I don't know whether I liked it that much, but uh, I'm not quite sure why. You know, I, I it never. It, it never really uh, grew on me at the, as, a, as a time at the, uh, as a player, but it's only a, like it's the L, the lethal rhyming with Lee, the two L's. I mean, it's. But yeah, no, my mum was never that keen on it for some reason. Thought thought it was denigrating a little boy. I think. <laughs> a lot of your contemporaries still call you lethal, don't they? 
Yeah, not too many people I know do. No, but blokes that played with you and against you. Um, I know Bernie Quinlan, for example, always calls you. Yeah, lethal. but yeah, the odd, well, so the Hawthorne people always call me Barney. That's mm-hmm. been my yep. nickname at uh, at Hawthorne. So there, there, there's not many people actually call me Lethal. To be honest, it's more been the uh, you know the public nickname as opposed to what uh, you know what people call me in general. Now I presume Barney is uh, derived from Barney Rubble, and it was, was given to you by Peter Hudson. It was, yeah. When when I was playing reserves uh, and uh, he, in the pre-game, the senior players were watching. <laughs> Peter Hudson apparently said one day, "Geez, he runs like Barney Rubble." And that was it. Yeah. Uh, so they, the Barney stuck in the Hawthorne, uh, and anyone I, anyone that I see around Hawthorne now would would still call me Barney if I saw them. Now, it was a very good book about your life, uh, titled Lethal. Only because you wrote it uh, with me, Mike, yes. <laughs> you said in that that you played the game aggressively and physically. Hmm. A lot of football followers would say and add dirty to that. Is that fair or not? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, I think it's fair. I mean, I, uh, <laughs> as you, you mentioned at the start of this, that I'm a 58-year-old mild-mannered grandfather now. But I had a fire in my belly when I was young. I can hardly remember it. You know, I was pretty cool and callous. I mean, it all happened on the spur of the moment. But I kind of, uh, yeah, my, um, you know, my urge to win and succeed, um, I guess, to a degree, overwhelmed the, what you'd say is my competitive morality, when, if you want to boil it down. So, therefore, the tags that were put on you in the physicality uh, in the way you played, I mean, it's hard for me to argue with, 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 with a, lot of, uh, a lot of that because it was probably true. But is it, do you know the origin of this? I mean, is this just the competitive spirit or is there yeah. something, when you reflect on it, that... Um, no, you... no, I've got there, no, there's no origin. There, I, um, no, I, I just, I, and again, it was, nothing was ever premeditated with, with me, but on the spur of the moment, uh, I mean, the old rush of blood to the head happened, you know, uh, quite a bit, when, if, I, if I was to be honest. There's uh, been lots of celebrated incidents involving you. Is there one that causes you more distress than any other? Well, the one that happened in 1985 with Neville Bruns uh, was, a, was a difficult, I mean, I did the wrong thing, but the wrong thing's when it's cratchit on, uh, on, uh, on vivid pitches, so everyone else knows you, knows you did the wrong thing as well, and of course the police got involved and I had to go to court over it. So that, that was really nasty and it was very difficult, it was very hard to defend yourself when you, when you knew that you would, had done the wrong thing. Yeah. Did that hurt you? It hurt you as it certainly hurt your reputation for a period, mm. I think. But did it hurt you personally? Yeah. Well, did at the time? Yeah. 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 In yeah. what sense? I mean, do you, oh, my memory oh, is guilt, that you really. even wondered whether you should continue no, guilt. playing. Yeah, guilt. Yeah. yeah, I did the wrong thing, and this is you know, yeah, could a bit bit like the old living with yourself and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Um, that um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I probably feel fortunate in a way that that happened in the last year of my career. I, I often wonder to myself if something. It's sort of, you know, it's, it's, I don't know, just as traumatic for me, even though I was the, you know, I was the aggressor. If that had happened early in your career, it might have affected you a lot Mm. in what happened thereafter. But it happened in my 17th and final year. But, you know, I also think it uh, finally, it happened partly too, because I was a crotchety old 33-year-old. Yeah. Have you crossed paths with Neville Bruns since that day? Don't think so. No, don't think so. You were quite... Not scathing, but you were certainly pointed in your book about the Bruns reaction. I know Bill Cannon did an yep. interview with Neville Bruns, I think, a yep. day or two after yep. the incident, yep. uh, and said some things that seemed to upset you. Well, I guess you know, I guess it's a bit like what stays on the field sta- happens on the field stays on the field, and not, and that and that sort of went past that probably. So at the time, there's at the time, we, you know, that uh, that I think that. I think his reaction was part of the reason the police got involved, partly because the victim was aggrieved. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I'd been the victim, it would have just come and gone, if you know yep. what I mean. But anyway, that's, uh, that, was, uh, that was a long time ago now. Yeah, sure. You, I, well, before I leave Bruns, I know there's obviously a level of discomfort with Bruns for you, but yep. did, it, did it prompt you to actually think about... Um, uh, my memory was that you were even contemplating quitting the game immediately. Well, yeah, no, on the, uh, on the Sunday after it, um, I'm, I remember thinking to myself, I'm never going to play again. This is, you know, like I just again. And I remember Alan, Alan Jeans came around on the Sunday afternoon, Sunday night. And he might have said something on the lines of, don't let this be the last memory of your, of your playing days. But I oh, know, you know, as I say, you can feel sorry for yourself. But it was, a, you know, it was a, it was a difficult emotional time um, at, at that point. 
you nearly uh, caused Western Australia to secede from the Commonwealth yep. uh, in an incident involving... Now, this is, this is going to be a long interview if you're going to just keep marking these <laughs> no, things no, up, this I'm going to take you through all the phases of your yeah, life. Yeah, but yeah. The, the cable one, I think that yeah. also caused you some angst, didn't it? Um, well, not the, not, not the angst of the, the whole brunt situ- situation. Um, I know it happened. But it, they, remember, that was about 50, that was 1971, say. Foot, what, what was expected normal, frowned upon, was a different even in 70 to 85, and much more in, if it happened in 2011, as, you could, as we could imagine. So I oh, know, I mean, again, it was, uh, I, um, again, I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm the aggressor. I kind of did the wrong thing, but I don't think it caused an enormous amount of angst thereafter. Did in Western Australia, didn't it? Oh, probably, but I lived in Victoria. <laughs> okay. Now, I'll, one more, and I'll leave the, yeah. uh, the thuggery. The, the Grant Simmons one, I do remember you telling me the story, the Footscray player at Waverley that you hit. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure, even sure whether it was within the laws of the game, but you actually thought that you uh, might have yeah. almost killed yeah, him. No, was, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I, you know, in, in, a, in a guy, it, just, what, it was so much more physical, or the, the violence you could inflict was so much more sort of not, if, if not within the rules, feasible in that earlier years. I mean, now we, we know that uh, that can't happen. And uh, But no, that was, he, I was coming one direction, he was coming back from a mark and, and he, he like went, looked like he was unconscious and he was shaking and it was, you know, I, I thought I'd, you know, you'd almost think, geez, if I killed him. I mean, it was a terrible thought to have. Um, yeah, so that, that was a, yeah, that's a, that's a nasty memory. Didn't you send someone from Hawthorne into the Footscray rooms at half time to check on his. I don't know, but I, I heard at half time he was, you know, awake and he was he was okay, which was a, which was a nice thing to know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When you when you're not sure what uh, what what had transpired. I mean, because as I say, you do things on the spur of the moment, but then the aftermath. You've got to wear the aftermath because you've done the action. But you, when you do the action, you're not thinking of the aftermath. Yep. Yep. I understand. Time. Alan Jeans tells the story, Lee, that one of your former teammates, Norm Goss, who grew up in Port Melbourne, said. Quote, there are shielders in Port Melbourne who throw punches better than lethal. Yet the blokes that you hit, they all stayed hit, didn't they? <laughs> well, it's quite funny. My kids used to say, Dad, you're not that tough. I said, tell as many people as you like. They won't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know what you mentioned before about the thing staying on the ground. What happens on the ground stays on the ground. Robert Klomp got you at Princess Park one day, didn't he? Um, uh, I might have. There were a couple of heavy yeah, hits. Yeah, in, yeah, 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 yeah. A couple of heavy, couple yeah, of heavy yeah, hits in your yeah. career. Ivan Eckerman in the state game in, yeah, in Adelaide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Klomp, I think. Yeah. Your view then was, well, you just win them and wear them. I mean, that yeah. happens, yeah. 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 Well, yeah, I mean, it, I, you know, Dobie John Kennedy, who was our, the big influence when you were a teenager, it was like it's impersonal. It's, not, it's about my jumper versus their jumper. It's not about Lee Matthews versus the, an individual person. So, yeah, it was kind of impersonal. And I, and, no, I never, if someone inflicted punishment on me, I was never aggrieved. Because that sort of like part of it. Yeah, yeah. After the break, Matthews talks about his relationship with his captain Don Scott and names the teammate he most enjoyed watching play. You started as a rover and you kicked 915 goals. I mean, how would you describe yourself as a footballer? Well, you can't get goals from the back 50. I didn't go near no, there very much. No, you didn't venture much, down you know. there often. They often joke that uh, in my playing time, they didn't have the 50 metre lines. And if they did, I would have known where not to go any further into the fence. Um, no, well, obviously I was, a, a, I was a, you know, a on ball forward. And, uh, I mean, you, uh, of course, I was right second rover as, as the position designation was back in that period of time with Peter Crimmins early on. When 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 Crimo would have done two thirds of the on ball, I would have done a third of the a third of the uh, a third of it, and then I guess once you know I was the main on baller, I'd still I, I think I got a feeling I'd be forward half the time. I, I reckon I'd only be half and half. I don't think I would feel that I was spending you know more more time on ball or more time up forward. I mean I finished my career playing as a permanent forward for two or three years, but in that time when I was on baller. Rovers don't actually play on each other, so let me ask you about the rover you most respected from the opposition and the play you found most difficult when you were playing forward. 
Yeah, well, I mean, the, 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 when the Rovers in that era in the main um, were, we were playing, while we were playing the same position, you might not even touch your opponent. Like when it was uh, Kevin Bartlett or Gary Wilson or Barry Cable, I mean, Wayne Richardson, the, 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 you'd play the same position, but you might shake hands before and after the game, but you didn't necessarily play on a chat. I, I always think of the defenders are the people that I played on. And it's funny, I look at the extremities, I think, who were the hardest opponents? Everyone I played on in 1985 seemed to be pretty hard <laughs> in my last year. And very early on, um, Barry Lawrence, he played centre-half back a fair bit, but he was playing, I used to, he used to play me a little bit in my first few years. That was almost unfair. John Rantel, uh, were, who, for the, uh, in, the, in that era where Hawthorne were playing the Kangaroos regularly uh, you know, in, in the finals, uh, I never seemed to do, a, do terribly well on him. Well, I think name, explain that because I saw John Rantel play centre half back on Robert Walls. Yes, and then he would go to the back pocket and play on you. What made him such a difficult opponent? Oh, I think I think it, as a sense, apart from the fact he was the same size as me, you know, I I got a feeling that if I could, if I'd be on the normal little back pocket, I could sort of out uh, muscle him if you know what I mean. But he, you know, like Barry Lawrence and and uh, John Rantel, they were, they were certainly as big as me. Um, and I think he used to, I, I got a feeling he used to make sure that I couldn't get goal side of him. Yep. So if I got the footy, it was sort of up, not at, back in that, in that sort of the, the, the goal scoring area. I think that's maybe what he did. And yeah, he, he was physically, he, he could sort of match me in the, in just in the contest and in the air. You play with a bevy of great players at Hawthorne, heaps of them. It was yes. a great era. Is there one that you enjoyed watching playing alongside more than any other? Well, I always think Peter Knights because Peter and I played for seven, the same 17 years. We, we're, I think, about 20 days difference in age. And uh, we, we turned up at Hawthorne in January of 1969 and we left after the grand final of 1985. So, and, I, and, I, and you know, Peter, tall, blonde-haired athlete, you know, all that. I was often joking, like a, we're like twins, but really, <laughs> it's like Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker. You know, I mean, we, Nietzsche was always just the, the sort of the glamour boy. Everyone loved Nietzsche because he was a ball player and he's spectacular. And we, we, we just shared the whole era. Yeah. You talked about player. you talked about arriving at, at, at Hawthorne. What sort of kid were you when you got? Because you're only young. I think you were 16, were you not? Um, well, I would have been 16 in January because I would have turned 17 in March. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, of that first year. So of were you shy or confident, or? What, what? Oh no, I was never confident. I mean, I guess sometimes now you, you know, in this part of your life, maybe you've got a little bit more um, self-assuredness, I suppose. But I, uh, I never felt. I don't think I ever felt confident ever, even when I was a thirty, you know, like in a prime as a player. So when I was a kid, uh, you know, you, you're just trying to make your way. Like I'm, the, I'm the little kid from Chelsea trying to make my way and. To a degree, you still felt that's been what you've been most of your life. Mm-hmm. Much has been made of your relationship with another bloke you've played a lot of years with, Don Scott, who was yes. your captain. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, premiership teammate of yeah. yours. Yeah. Um, what was what was the, the relationship? I mean, from the outside looking in, it was as if you two never spoke to each other. No, it wasn't that bad. It was teammates and acquaintances. I mean, we're not. It, it's just some people think that just because you play football with people, you're all best friends and best mates. It's just not the case. Never has been. Now, it's just in, in Don, Don Scott was captain, Michael Tuck, so captain was Ruckman, I should say. Michael Tuck was uh, the Ruck Rover and I was the Rover for about a decade. But we just used to go to training and play footy together. We, you know, but all I'm saying is we weren't close friends, but we weren't enemies. And a lot, lot is made of uh, you know, the, the Don, Don, Don Scott and myself. We certainly weren't enemies, but we just weren't very close, but we were teammates. But I certainly respected the way his... You know, desire and what the way he went about his, his footy. I hope he did the same. So again, we can say I can see Don. Hello, how are you going? We're not enemies or anything like that, but it was just an example of teammates who played footy together, but not necessarily were best buddies. So it didn't. It wasn't a situation that needed John Kennedy's intervention. No, 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 no. no it was never anything that was no. going to be detrimental. No, okay. Um, John Kennedy, the, your yep. coach, and obviously a huge influence on your yep. career and life, yep. said in your book, more than any other footballer. Lee has demonstrated the capacity to remain cool under extreme pressure. Is that, is that, a, a, I mean, he's painting that as this sort of almost outstanding trait in your football makeup. Mm. Does that surprise you? Well, it's funny, you know, like, I mean, we're doing this at the MCG. I mean, the MCG's been almost the place 
that, 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 you, that, that I feel is like home. But the footy field, when I was young, when I was a player, being out in the footy field, I felt completely at home there, more at home there than, than anywhere else. Now, the, the ability to look like, I mean, the, I, I think I've always had something about in my exterior never really mirrors my interior. And I've always had a fairly cold sort of exterior, which makes people think you're yeah, calm when all it is is you're not, you look calm. Um, but anyway, that's, that, I guess that's a nice um, observation that you look like you were calm under pressure. Did you ever cross swords with, with Kanga? Oh, I used to have nightmares about him in, uh, uh, in, in the early days, like because he was a really hard, he was really hard on you. And, uh, and, I, and I reckon from, um, say, uh, 20 to 23, I used to have nightmares about him. And then when I turned 23 or 24, I figured I was wrong and he was right. <laughs> Did you believe that? No, I did eventually. But yeah, yeah. again, in my early 20s there, I think for some reason, I just, yeah, I was just, you know, I just, yeah, I used to have nightmares about him because he, he was I really, really hard on you. I mean, praise was rare. Um, that was just the kind of uh, that coach John was. He had two legendary coaches at Hawthorne, Kennedy and Alan Jeans. And David Parker. And David Parker. Mm. What lessons for life did you learn from, from those blokes? Oh, John, John just drilled into us the basic lesson in life that we don't live on an island ourselves, and it doesn't matter how driven and how ambitious you may be, the group comes before the individual. And it doesn't matter what you think, that's where it has to be. So he kind of drilled that into you as just the way of the world. Valuable lesson, I reckon. Remember when you're tired and you think you can't go any further, you can. Do it and see how you go. David Parkin was started to do the planning and review process around the game back in the late 70s. Uh, he, so he was, you know, that, and then Alan Jeans was just the most fantastic man manager. Um, and, and he always had the fantastic ability that even though he was a disciplinarian, and, but he all, everyone felt he was on their side. And just knew, I mean, he was, the, he was a better psychologist than any qualified psychologist I've ever met. He just knew how to, how to get the best out of people. Were you a bit of a loner in your early days? I mean, the, th- the story was that you would train and then jump in your car and go home and you yeah. would play and do the yeah, same was. thing. Yeah. And we used to read in the papers that you, you didn't want to go on interstate trips, yeah. uh, interseason trips. I was an 18-year-old father. Mm. So I had a very different youth in a way. I mean, uh, I was married at 18, was a father at 18. So therefore, as a young man, I was, I was actually kind of had the, the wife and child. Yeah. So I wasn't actually out associating with my peers, probably, who were obviously more likely to be uh, associating together, you know, outside of football. And that's probably where that, you know, you're just living a very different life to most other of the young footballers of the same age. Amazing to think of it now. You started an AFL career at 17. Yes. You're married at 18. You're a father at 19. Yeah. I was a father at 18. At 18. Mm. Were you working? Do you have a... Yeah. Do- well, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I, uh, I, uh, my first year at Hawthorne was 17. I was doing year 12. And then that, the, the second year, obviously, I was, I was working. Yeah. So, I mean, as we know, everyone worked another job outside football until well, close enough. I, when I went to Collingwood as a coach, I was full time. But most footballers worked another job up until some stage in the early to middle 90s there. Tell us how you got to Collingwood. I mean, did you, were you of the mind as soon as you finished playing football that you wanted to be a coach? It was just a progression. I don't think I ever thought about coaching until it got to the stage that I wasn't going to be able to play anymore. And, and, I, and I think most of 80, 1985, I thought this would be our, my last year. And no one tried to talk me out of it at Hawthorne. <laughs> so, I, so late, uh, some, some stage late in 1985, I was asked, was I interested in you know, doing a, a job at uh, Collingwood? I said, oh, well, yeah. it, when the season's finished, I'm happy to talk. And, and you know, one thing led to another. Bob Rose, who was coach at the time, and Randall McDonald, who was chairman at the time, you know, we met with them. And, well, that was going to be the succession plan. Nothing new in succession plan. No, Bob, no. Bob Rose... You know, the idea was I'd be assistant coach for 12 months and take over from Bob at the end of 1986. And Bob Rose was the person who was, you know, pushing that. Um, so that's how, it, how, that's how my uh, involvement with Collingwood began. So Bob Rose actually then withdrew, I think, five or six weeks into the season, didn't he? Well, it was after round three, of, round three uh, yeah. of 1986. And, and Collingwood had lost the first three games. And as history would say, they were almost bankrupt. Mm. I can still remember the... I got the phone call on the Sunday morning after, I think the, the round three might have been against the Kangaroos at the MCG here. 
and the and the phone call from Bob on the phone saying, Lee, I think it's time you took over. I can still remember the, the sentence, but it was incredibly exciting for me because I'd been sort of assistant coach for six months and still hadn't worked out what assistant coach is supposed <laughs> to do. So it was incredibly exciting. But of course, after round three of 86, you wouldn't believe it, the chairman, the football manager, the CEO and the coach all changed at Collingwood after round three of 1986. Mm. So massive, it was a massive yeah, change. Yeah. Yeah. You said you were excited. The sensation was just one of excitement. Oh, there was yeah, no apprehension. Yeah. You were ready? Oh, no. I didn't think, I don't know about ready, but I wanted, I was ready to actually have a go at it. You know, so it was exciting to, to have the opportunity. Um, uh, probably didn't have the training, but to yeah. get the opportunity. When do you think, that was your start in, in 86. Yeah. When do you believe that you'd learnt enough about it, been in it long enough to have actually been at your best as a coach? I don't know. I, I coached for 20 years, and what I know about that is if I had the talent, we could be really good. Yeah. If we didn't have the talent, we weren't much good. I was no miracle worker as a coach. Okay. So therefore, it's hard to answer that question. All I know is in 86, we, had, we didn't have a bad year after that bad start and just missed the finals in, was it a final five? But we might have finished sixth. And then we had a really bad year in, in 87. There was a lot of players, a lot of changeover of players. All I know is if we hadn't had a good year in 1988, I would never, that would have been the end of my coaching career, I would have thought. Really? As it turned out, we, we were top four in 1988, and you know, obviously thereafter we got home in 1990. Coming up, Matthews provides an insight into the importance to Collingwood of the late Darren Mullane and the time he gambled on the health of a key lion in a grand final. Looking here for Matthews, Matthews in the front position. Oh, beautiful mark by Matthews. He'd be the highest paid in the business. Look at that. You had some good players at Collingwood. Yep. One I want to ask you about, um, uh, the late Darren Mullane. Yes. He fascinates Collingwood supporters. Yes. They loved him. Yeah. He played the finals in 1990 with a broken thumb. Yep. Tell us your recollections of Darren Mullane. Well, he, he was a gigantic influence because he was a real powerful, really powerful individual. Um, and uh, you knew his coach, if he wasn't on side... Yeah, no hope. Yeah, I mean, Tony Shaw was obviously a, he was the captain. He was a major influence. But Darren was a you know you, you need to get him on side. So you did a lot of work with him, and he was basically I think anti-authoritarian by nature. But anyway, we got to 1990, and when he uh, when he broke his thumb uh, in round 20, that looked like he was in plaster and he was out for six weeks. And when he came to me ten days later and said, "Listen, I've been to the surgeon." said, maybe we can strap it up and put the painkillers in and I can play. So I gave him the softest fitness test ever because, uh, you know, you, you can sometimes play with a, a hand that's not working properly. You could never do that with a leg injury, obviously. Anyway, we got him on the field. But the, ma the magnificent thing about those behind the scenes is you should have seen the pain he was in post-game because he might have been able to inject it up so for five consecutive weeks, he went through the, the, uh, the campaign of actually knowing post-game he's just going to be in this incredible agony once the pain killers started to wear off. They'd, put it, they'd re plaster it again. So we, everyone can sometimes have stitches with that anaesthetic in the middle of a game because adrenaline's flowing, but when you know that's going to happen in advance and you put yourself through it, 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 there was an incredible inspiration that he provided by just doing that and still being of value in, 19, in that 1990 final series. There's a bloke called Peter Dacos who was a pretty good player yep. for you that year too. Yep. It was probably a sour finish for, for, for Dakes at Collingwood, uh, and you were there, but yep. Dakes at his best must have been one of the, the greatest players that you saw. Yeah, play. no, well, he was a freak. I mean, particularly, I mean, he was a, had just fantastic ball skills, the low centre of gravity. But, I mean, what we'll all remember about Dakes is his finishing, his ability to... Uh, to make the sort of the impossible goal, the, the, the bouncing goal, which he used to do, which we see that often now, but he was uh, he, he was incredibly talented. And in that year, if we knew, he kicked 92 goals. So that was the part of his career where where he played pretty much permanent forward. Didn't you know? He started off as a as a midfielder. So yeah, wonderfully talented, left or right foot. He could turn onto his left foot and 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 convert just as easily. Wonderful player. When you finished at Collingwood, do you think you, did you think you were done as a coach? Yeah, in my time, yeah, yeah. Well, not so much done as a coach, but I kind of look back on my coaching and think that I, that I've got a, a, a five or seven years is my maximum value, I think, in an organise in, in in a footy club. And uh, so, the, so the Collingwood got to its tenth year, 
and for whatever set of circumstances, I mean, the, I was sacked, but I was, you know, it was like, it was time uh, for me, and it's hard to know, it's hard actually to accept it's your time, so mostly someone has to tap you on the shoulder, but it was the right thing for me to finish. I'd had my decade, that was, it was time for someone else to come in. Did you in fact get tapped on the shoulder? Yeah, yeah. Why? Yeah. Well, Alan McAllister, I suppose. The man that promised you the job for life. <laughs> oh, yeah, but that, you know, well, that's... Yeah. You no, know, I, that was because I like Alan. But, I mean, I think in the euphoria of the 90 premiership, everyone was there for life. Yeah, well, anything that's said within 24 hours <laughs> of a premiership, there should be a moratorium on because it doesn't count. What, what swayed you to go to Brisbane? I think at the time yeah. you were happy yeah. in, in the media. Well when, well, when I finished at Collingwood, I just thought I just, I had no inclination. I remember speaking to Sheej in the final series of uh, 1995 and, uh, about that I just wanted to stop coaching for a while, but I thought I would coach again. Sheed said, no, I'd be coaching next year if I was you. I remember, say, I remember Sheed saying that. Uh, but one year led to two years, and then after two years, I thought, well, well, it's done. And I got into the third year, I was sort of working, you know, doing the media work, but I just thought, well, that's the, you know, I've had my coaching stint and that's come and gone. And, you know, late in uh, 1998, Brisbane made contact and even then I was only talking to them about out of courtesy. And then, I don't know, over the few weeks, I just slipped down the well and decided I, I wanted to do it again. You weren't fulfilled in the media though, were you? Well, you're never fulfilled in the media like you are at club level because... I mean, the thing about, about club level footy is your emotions are on the line. If you care about the footy club, whether you're a player or a coach or a fan, you're putting your emotions on the line when you go to the footy. And you know that at the end of the day, if it's a good day, I might go home feeling happy, but there's a fair chance I'm going to go home feeling miserable. So that's, that, you sort of, that cycle gets part of you and it's, it's that you never get the extremities of emotions outside club level. So therefore, when you're doing the media, you can enjoy it. I love the footy. I enjoy doing it. But you don't get that, uh, that extremity of emotion, uh, the emotional roller coaster that you might hate, but you also get ingrained into you a bit. Talking about emotions, Brisbane's first flag, that must yeah. have been something special. Yeah. Well, it was. I mean, it was part of the, I guess, the romance of the Brisbane was that at that time, the frontier states, Sydney and Brisbane, who, who could be the first team to win it out of out of the, the Sydney the Swans of course and the Lions uh, so that was a bit of romance of course it was the first and and, uh, and uh, I oh, when you go up there I mean you always you're in the competition so you want to win a premiership but I had no it was a bit it was beyond my wildest dreams to think that that Brisbane would you'd win premierships in Brisbane and and for a lot of sort of good fortune a lot of good talent a lot of things worked together uh, you know we had a an unbelievable early 2000s. Do you think, had you been given a seven day break in 2004, yep. between the preliminary grand finals, could you have won four in a row? It would have helped. I'm mean, nothing, you know, you can never guarantee yes or no, but uh, yeah, that uh, the, uh, as we know, just to, you know, the, the, now if you qualify, you get the home preliminary final. Back then, there was this deal with the MCG that one of the preliminary finals had to be the MCG. Clearly, Port Adelaide had qualified higher than us, so they'd earned the right to have it. So the system at the time said, OK, we've earned the right to play Geelong in Brisbane, but we have to come to Melbourne to play. I can sort of live with that. The decision that was made to play the game Saturday night rather than Saturday afternoon, you know, it, 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 we talk in little things here, I know, but I, I, it's much easier if we'd been back in Brisbane on Saturday night after the game here rather than as we, was we got back, you know, middle afternoon Sunday. So when you know you have to come down Thursday. So little things make a difference and it, uh, there, it was one of those uncontrollables that, uh, that didn't help our cause. Akamanis on the charge. This will lift the crowd. Akamanis takes him on, backs himself. Now you see him, now you don't. Pulls a rabbit out of the head. Jason Akermanis was one of your great players and certainly one of the most exciting players at Brisbane while you were yep, there. Yep. You two fell out badly in the finish, didn't you? Uh, well, in the finish, yeah. In the finish we did, yeah. 2006. Um, um, the, um, I mean, Jason uh, won the Brownlow in 2001. Went on a... You know, there, and thereafter, I, I think... Um, you know, he, I always felt like he was starting to work on his media career from that, from that point onwards. And gradually, over the ensuing years, uh, he just he, he, his, his uh, uh, willingness to be managed at all 
was difficult, but by 2006, he just wasn't prepared to be managed or coached at all. I think the, probably the straw to break the camel's back is when the players got involved to say, listen, you know, Aka, we, we, we need you to stop sort of putting, you know, just being publicly talking about stuff that's just putting pressure on everybody. And then the following week, he did. The, he did. And that was probably the, the thing that where the uh, where the the team the the leadership group just said it's you know time for him to leave our club. Lee, let me ask you about coaches playing taking players into games with injuries. Now, in two thousand and three in the grand final, Nigel Lappin played with a cracked rib or cracked ribs. Yeah, is that your decision? Well, your my decision. The medical people had to say, listen, we think we can get him through, and Nigel had to had, had to agree. But it is incredible. I, I remember Nigel arrived getting out of a car on the Tuesday before the grand final at the Gabba and could hardly get out of the car. Because anyone who's had cracked ribs knows for the first few days you feel like you're going to die. You can't breathe. It's terrible. Anyway, they, 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 the, the pain management specialists at the Wesley Hospital thought they could deaden his whole rib. Because, you know... Anyway, so... Oh, well, what the hell, give it a try. Uh, because he's a wonderful player, Nigel, and, and, and uh, just enormous courage. Anyway, we got to the Friday night. You had to test him, and, and they, they needled him up for the Friday night. Aaron Shattuck was probably going to be taking his spot, so he did the fitness test with him. And we really... I, I said, if you're going to break down, it's got to be tonight. Not tomorrow. It's got to be tonight. So we've got to test you. So we, we made it up really as physical as we could make it, and he seemed to survive that fine. And we got to the got to the following morning, and we got about an hour before the game when the team list has to be in. And Nigel is saying to me, "I think I'm all right, but I can't see to take deep breaths." And uh, and someone said to me, "Nigel has to eventually say yes, I'm okay. I'm no, I'm not. You just got to wait for him to make the decision. Chris Scott's going to be his replacement. He's warming up." I'm thinking to myself, "This is an hour before a grand final. I don't even know who's playing. This is ridiculous. How can we?" So it, it was just amazing, and Nigel eventually said, "Okay, mate, I think okay, I think I can give it a go." Turns out he had a punctured lung. He played the game with a punctured lung because that night, remember, he didn't. He, they discovered he had a, a minor, minor punctured lung. But I reckon we punctured his lung in the fitness test on the Friday night, and that's. But yeah, you know, he, he played, and we won, and everything was good. And if we'd lost, you would have been slain. Uh, you know that. You make decisions, and if they were <laughs> great, but it's not. It's in, on principle. Certainly not a good decision to take injured players in. I mean, apart from the stakes yeah. of the game, I mean, the, the, the means health. Well, yeah, I mean, well, I, I wasn't going to make it happen, but if Nigel wanted to do it and the medical people think it was, you know, it was safe and worthwhile, then we did it. And as, a, But you can imagine what happened if we'd had a bad day and we'd lost, you know, you would have got... We, uh, well, I would have, we would have got criticised enormously for playing someone who had a, an issue going in. Nathan Buckley and Michael Vosley. Yeah. You saw one of them up close... Yeah. Very closely for a long period. Yes. And obviously you're well aware of the capabilities of the other. Yeah. Can you separate them? I don't know about separate, but I mean, Michael Voss, you know, because I worked with him as coach captain for the best part of a decade, um, he was a wonderful, wonderful player and a wonderful captain. I mean, he was just, uh, I mean, I was so lucky. Tony Shaw was wonderful, wonderful captain and a wonderful player too. Vossi was probably a better player, I suppose. I think it's fair to say that. But they, you know, how lucky you are to have captains like that because they're so, so critical. So Vossi, just his understanding of how groups worked and his understanding of his on-field role as captain and his playing talents. He was such a hard, he was such a hard player uh, and so skillful, but so tough and hard so you know the one you had close ups the one you got to give the tick to yep. uh, because you saw him week in week out did you leave Brisbane on good terms yep yep your decision entirely yeah yep yep when you left when you made that decision yep. and you decided your time was up at Brisbane yep. did you know also that it was probably effectively the end of your coaching career oh yeah I'd, I'd say so but that wasn't it was more that it was another decade I I mean I when I, when I finished at Collingwood after the decade, uh, you know, you, you, I don't think I left the club in terribly good shape playing-wise, or well, I just, whether, whatever I did as coach, you know, the, wasn't in a great position. And uh, trouble is that in, in that six or seven year period at the Lions would have been about 2004, 2005. You know, one, like at the end of 2004, Alistair Lynch retired, uh, Marcus Ashcroft retired, and you knew in the next two or three years, there's this fantastic team but most of them were going to retire. 
and I and I I'm certain if I'd finished at 2004 2005, they'd now been another coach because mm-hmm. it was going to be Mission Impossible. I thought when I thought the club was in reasonable shape player wise at the end of 2008. Just looked like the, there was an upcoming that they were sort of pushing up a little bit. But I'd been uh, it had been in the back of my mind for the previous year or two that, that you know when's the right time. I only made that decision unequivocally on the afternoon of round 22 because now we're, we'd already started you know, planning for the, for the following year, but it just occurred to me now, the time, it's right, the season's ended, it's time to, for me to move on. You're just one year older than Mickey Malthouse, yep. who um, seems to be at the height of his powers at the yes, moment. Yep. Is it feasible for you to be coaxed back into coaching, uh, do you think? No, no. No, I'm a bit of a chameleon. I, I sort of tend to be what I need to be where I need to be it. And when I'm coaching, I've got to be that. And I prefer to be what I'm not without the coaching at this stage of my life. And that's, I, don't, I don't think that's going to change because I don't think I'm ever going to be 20 or 30 or 40 again. I've got no idea what you just told me then. You're a chameleon. What, what, <laughs> well, it means you act the role. When I'm coach... For instance, I, I do what I feel I need to do to do that role. Yep, yep. And you become that person. Yeah. And now now that I'm not that person because I'm not doing that role, I like the, you know, in a way I like the life and the person okay. that, okay. Okay. that is, uh, that is okay. not coaching rather than the coaching persona. Will you and Deb ever return to Melbourne, do you think, to live? Um, well, there's, not unless there's a reason, there's a stimulation to that that currently doesn't exist. I mean, you never know where life's going to take you. We all, we all know that. But uh, So you'll commute from Queensland to Melbourne for the 30 weeks of the footy season? Uh, well, that's what I've done the last couple of years and that's what I'll do in the immediate future anyway. Who, who of the modern players excites you most? You see a lot of them these days. Is there one that you just actually love the thought of going and watching them play football? Well, the first person that goes to your mind's always the right answer, probably Buddy Franklin. Mm-hmm. Um, Saw Liam Jarrah during the previous season. Which, I mean, he's got incredible excitement about him. But I, I think Buddy Franklin's 2008, I don't think anyone's played a better year than that. I reckon what he did in 2008, had over 200 shots at goal. He was just outstanding. And, and, and I don't know if he's quite been at that level in 09 and 10, but gee, he, he's just that physical, freakish talent. So they're the players that I think excite me, the guys that can do things that the average mortal can't. You don't barrack for anyone, obviously, because of your no. media role. No. In your heart, uh, when the crunch time comes, are you a Hawthorne man? Uh, is there any sort of affection still for Collingwood? Or is oh, it's not so much from my point of view. The one, uh, coaching being an off-field role, it's a bit like uh, King is dead, long live the king. As soon as you're not coaching anymore, no one can remember you. What you do? I'm not talking about you. No, no, but I'm saying. Yeah. So therefore, the club that you played for, I think, is the one... I think it's more the club... Uh, they, Hawthorne's been the opposition for 25 years, mm, but mm. the one the club you played for is the one that embraces you as part of them, much for more than the the, the teams that you've coached because coaching is a non visible role. Um, so I, uh, I, I I think in time you always feel a bit more aligned to Hawthorne than the other clubs I've been heavily involved with. Who's had the better career out of Gary Ablett Senior and Gary Ablett Junior? Um, well, see, Gary Ablett Jr. is a wonderful player and might have been the best player in the competition for the last three years, but he's, Gary Ablett Sr. was just a freak. You know, like, it's a bit like... I don't, know, I, don't, I, don't, I can't think of an analogy, but Gary's had just as good a career, I think, probably. I'm not saying that, but get what Gary Ablett Sr. That Wayne Carey's the best player that I've seen because he was more valuable in more games. But Gary Ablett Sr. was just a freak of a footballer, and, and it's hard to compare... Junior, even to his dad, because his dad was just so special in so many areas. Just for the record, I was one of the few people that had you at number two in the player, of this, uh, the best players I've seen, because I had Kerry at one. Can yep. you repeat? Kerry is the best player you've seen, isn't yeah, he? Yeah. Now he's the in his decade in, in the nineties. He he, he influ- I I think it's raised. It's all about how much you do to help your team win, and he helped North Melbourne win more often than any other player in my time in footy. So that, I think, gives him the right to be, therefore, the most valuable, best best player. But Gary Ablett Sr. is the most freakishly talented, but I think Wayne just did it so often. Back to the square! He's got it! What's, uh, what's left for Lee Matthews? Are there any horizons that you need to uh, aspire to? 
Oh, well, I guess that's a slightly sad thing. I haven't got any particular horizons that I'm aspiring to at the moment. I mean, I try to do the best I can for the jobs I do in the you know, Channel 7 and, and the media roles that I do. But you kind of, you know, if you say that things that sort of put you on edge, I, I mean, I, to a degree when I stopped coaching at club level, I withdrew myself from being on that extreme emotional roller coaster that club footy does for you. And nothing else quite does that, I think, in most other areas of, of, uh, of your life because you haven't got that siren goes and you've won or lost. Really, a really categoric uh, emotional finish. Is that why you go to South Africa now and go to game parks? Is that to, <laughs> to try to get the adrenaline yeah, pumping? No, well, yeah. no, not quite because you're pretty safe. As amazing as we know anyone who's gone game view, you drive up to a pride of lions five metres away and there's fresh air between you and them, but they ignore you. So I've never quite <laughs> know felt, who you are. I've never quite felt uh, <laughs> dangerous, but... Uh, no, my, uh, I think my thrill-seeking comes from trying to learn to ski because I'm completely out of my comfort zone, completely out of com- my control, and I don't enjoy that. <laughs> but I'm, pas- I'm persevering. <laughs> Let's reflect. I know it's just we just muse about what might have been. You are acknowledged as the player of the 20th century. You may have been a Brownlow medalist. Would you have preferred one to the other? There's been a lot of Brownlow medalists last century. <laughs> No, I, that, like I mean that. seriously. If you could be the player of the century or the Brownlow medalist, you'd take the, you'd have to take the player of the century any time. Yeah, because was, the only problem is it's not categoric. It's not official. Well, it's sort of it's become. No, official, I'm only saying. But it? seriously, I mean, I know it's a bit, you're being a bit facetious. But, Kike, if you could be player of the century or Brownlow medalist, you'd clearly be the player of the century. Lee, it's been a fantastic career. We've all admired what you've done on the football field. Congratulations to this point, and all the best for what's left ahead. Thanks, Mike. This has been a Fox Sports production.